So screen visible. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, yes, good, sir. So, very good. Very good. So let's just start. So we started uh, with this third unit, which is complex variables. What we are supposed to do is the complex valued function of complex variable. So when I'm talking about a function, of course, we are talking about a mapping which takes us from one complex plane to another. Uh, when I'm saying complex plane, it is basically uh, since I can represent my Z by two of the perpendicular axes X and Y, which is nothing but the real and the imaginary part of the Z. So argon diagram. And uh, we wrote our function FZ as U plus I, I V which means that a complex valued function of complex variable is equivalent to two real valued functions of two real variables. Then we discussed about the differentiability at a point. We did not derive the uh, cauchy riemann conditions, but we did discuss that one important aspect of the differentiability of complex valued function is that independent of from which direction you approach the limit, that limit must be unique. And that puts a strong bound on these uh, UX and VX. That is, we have to ensure that if a function is differentiable at a point, then that happens only if UX, VX, UY, VY exist. And not only that, they must obey UX is equal to VY and uy is equal to minus vx, which is the shorthand notation which we used. Of course, these uh, four uh, functions, I mean the derivatives, must be continuous. I also asked you to look into this shorter definition, but which is very relevant of the same, which we call as the complex analog of the cauchy riemann conditions that if a function f is derivative at a point or in a domain d, then that function cannot be the function of x minus i y. It can only be x plus i y. That means there cannot be any z star term. We discussed about the entire function. We discussed about the harmonicity that once we understand that u and v obey these Cauchy Riemann equations or conditions, then the functions u and v are individually harmonic. That is that they obey the Laplace equations. And I uh, towards the end, I also give one problem del u dot del v. Uh, find out that particularly for u is equal to constant and v is equal to constant. Did somebody try to find out that and uh, do this del f over del z star equal to zero homework? I can understand that you were busy preparing for your internal assessment, but please look into my last lecture and try to do the homework. That's important. Yeah, you are. One thing which was very important is that analytic function in complex domain, please mute all of you, is infinitely differentiable. That if a function is differentiable in a domain, then the function will be infinitely differentiable in that domain. So f prime exists in that domain, f double prime exists in that prime domain so on and so forth uh, this does not have any counterpart in our uh, real functions uh, please all of you please mute yeah after that finding the differentiation is rather simple because complex differentiation follows all the same rule as those are there for the real uh, variable so if fz and gz are two functions and you are finding out fz plus gz uh, derivative, then it will be f prime z plus, plus g prime z. Uh, even for uh, the product, you have the product rules. The quotient, as long as the denominator is not zero, the same rules which you are applying. So differentiation wise, this calculus, this is what we are interested in doing, the calculus of complex valued function, that is pretty well, well controlled. It's the integration which now takes us to something interesting. But before that, I just want to ask a question. Let's say there is a domain in which FZ is analytic everywhere. That means differentiable at all points. So if there exists this point, let's say Z naught, where this function is not analytic. So if there exists a single point, then what do we call that point as? 
so fz is analytic point of singularity analytic everywhere except at z not or there can be even finite number of points for infinite points this becomes little bit tricky so points of singularities can somebody name certain singularities regular irregular regular and irregular singularities so what are regular and what are irregular the regular are those which can be removed i guess and irregular are not removable okay anybody else so uh, which are not removable any uh, further classification in that So poles and zeros. Poles and zeros are zeros are not the problem, right? I mean, principle. Because the function is just zero there, so it is yes. still analytic, right? Yeah, but I understand that you have read your zeros and poles both uh, together. That's a good point, right? And uh, anything else? Okay. Uh, we will come to that and uh, when we are going to do the series expansion we are going to uh, do that but please understand uh, i just want you to know that we are going to discuss about the points where if the function is not analytic we call those points as the singularities and currently we are going to be interested only in the isolated finite number of singularities what kind of singularities are there we are going to again discuss but it is assumed that you have already done it in your uh, under graduation courses okay so what we are going to do in today's class then we are going to start with basically the topic of complex integration so the calculus has two parts the integration and differentiation does somebody remember the fundamental theorem of calculus No. Okay. No. Okay. I'm not going to work on that right now, but I may. So let's say that there exists a curve. Now, when I am saying a curve, that means that this curve is lying in a complex plane. So we are most of the time talking about continuous curve here. remember since most of the time we are interested in the analytic functions and we will discuss why particularly in integration then these functions uh, the first condition for uh, derivative is that the function has to be continuous although the integration can be defined even with the piece wise continuous function and it is very similar by the way in the real plane as well as in the complex plane so let me just write down something and then i discuss it so i divide the whole interval into a smaller sub interval let's say z1 z2 z3 so on and so forth up to zn and i say that the function is piece wise continuous so let's say this is this function is f of z and we choose a point let's say zeta so in this case let's say zeta 1 so f zeta j times z minus j minus 1 is equal to now this definition of the integral which i have written is very similar to what you do the definition in real axis so if i or a real plane so if i have x and i have fx and i want to find out the integration of this function fx between x0 and xn then the same formula applies except that of each of these z will be replaced by x for the real axis integration 
yeah and that formula this formula of integration we call as the riemannian integration so integration wise the definition is not dif different however there are of course implications and interpretations which will be different for example in real axis if i ask you what is area under the curve x0 and xn so what is this guy area how do you find out integration from so it is the integration of the real function right now yes, if sir. i say uh, if i want to find out area under this curve does this guy has any interpretation here is it something two dimensional area or something because each of the point the difference lies is this each of the point corresponds to two of the points here so x and y n so in principle we are doing the integration from x0 y0 to x and y n yeah so there is no co corresponding definition in terms of the area remember in the real world we are talking about real quantities which can be measured in the complex one world as soon as we go towards the imaginary axis it is something that we are using for our convenience in most of the cases or we build a quantity which becomes real and then we measure it so the complex integration as such does not have that interpretation as we have it in the real one so why do we do then complex integration what is the purpose that we are fulfilling then anybody because you have all done your event cauchy residue theorem and hence i am just asking this question why do we do i mean complex integration so to simplify the analyticity of the function i guess in some of the cases when we cannot uh, find the integral directly uh, like taking it in the complex form helps us to uh, like find it like in case of singularities or near near the point where it, like if zero lies within a particular area and we want to integrate it uh, the real function so we take help of the complex function and uh, find the uh, integral by avoiding that point and all excellent answer this extends the reach of real integration and when i'm saying real integration it is a real function integration so at this point of time since what we are saying that in most of the cases when we are doing integration we are ultimately going to get the real part of that and we are going to use it as the physical point but then doing the integration itself only in the real plane may or may not be even feasible or very tricky so complex integration if you do not understand it or remember it for any other reason one reason is sure sure that it extends the reach of real integration but then there is a real need real need will also come from the integration if whenever you are integrating something of the form psi x dx or uh, psi x t dx kind of a function whenever you are in case if you are then there is a possibility that you will see some i or imaginary number so you should be just knowing what would be the way to solve it but at this point of time let's just take it for one particular reason and that particular reason is that we are going to extend the reach of real integration but is that very simple or not so we are going to see in the subsequent lectures few of those lectures how we are going to perform complex integration and what are the complexities of the complex integration okay so first word which comes whenever we start with the complex integration is what we call as the contour integration now what is contour so i wrote integral as z not to zn fz dz which is same as saying 
that I am integrating a complex valued function over a path where C is the path lying in the complex pin. And this path is generally called contour. Although if you go strictly by the nature, then you will read arc first, curve second, contour as the third one. But please see that the path of integration, when I'm saying the path of integration, it is going from point Z0 to Zn. That path, since it's lying in the complex plane, it doesn't have any real function analog directly. And hence that path, we have to define what kind of path it is. So most of the time we use the word arc and curve interchangeably. But the word arc and curve, cu curve is general curve, just like I have drawn. And if I just choose Z2 to Z3 point, uh, you will see that people start writing it as arc. But for our purposes, as soon as we understand, portion of the curve is an arc. It's a piecewise continuous function in that portion. Yeah, and whenever we are integrating, we call the same path as contour. So for us, remember, whenever we start with the complex integration, we call that contour integration. This is something like saying the integration over a path, whatever path it is. Now in the real world also, there is some path which the function is following. But in the complex plane, when it uh, has that, we call that as a contour. Okay. Now, this integral can also be converted into the real integrals. How to do that? What is Fz? U plus IV. What is Dz? Dx plus IDY. And remembering O X not Y not to X N Y N. That is remembering that Z not is nothing but X not Y not and Z N is nothing but X N Y N. So I can write down the same as X not Y not to X N Y N U D X minus V D Y plus I times again the same limits X zero Y zero to xn yn and vdx plus udy. Now, if you look into this integral, each of the integral is a real integral. udx minus vdy, u is a real function of xy, dx, of course, real, vdx, vxy, v is a function of xy, dy, and so this is what we call as nothing but the line integral. That's what we use the word in case of your real integrals, line integral. So you will see that these two words are commonly associated with the complex integration or the co integration of a complex function over a path. But yes, one has to be clear in terms of that line integral is the sum. What kind of sum? It's a complex sum because there is a factor of i which is involved. So it's a complex sum of real integrals. Have you seen uh, anywhere the simple sum of real integrals also as the line integral? Where have you used this word? Line integral, surface integral, volume integral. Sir, in case of the theorems which we Gauss, uh, Gauss theorem and uh, Stokes theorem, which we consider. And which comes under vector broad vector. topic of vector analysis. Vector. Vector. vector analysis. Right, right, vector analysis. So remember, whenever you are writing a vector, vector is a function of, I mean, in principle, it's collection of three points. That is closest, I mean, if you can think of. Because vector is a collection of three point X, Y and Z and our complex function is a collection of two points. We have some sort of an analog there, except that in the case of vector, it's a real word we are talking about, R cube on R. So we are talking about three dimensional real space. 
whereas in case of the complex integration we are not talking about that but the good point is since we have done that vector uh, i mean integration so that this line integral you are basically taking it from there that is sum of real integrals and similarly that the complex integral it is a sum of real integrals except that it will be a complex sum of real integral so the two words which you will keep on hearing whenever you will start with your complex integration one the definition is so contour integration and the line integral which are basically synonymous because you are representing the same thing by two ways other than that it's basically same yeah just like z is represented by x y okay questions up to this point since we are still dealing with the definition so okay when we do the problem so let's say uh, that means if there exist a curve such that i can divide this curve on two paths so there exists a curve c lying in complex plane which is divided into two parts c0 and c1 so i can write down my integral fz as the sum of the two integrals some properties of these uh, contour integrals or the line integrals not only that if you define this point z0 and zn then fz dz is same as or with the minus sign property is very similar in the real world or the real, uh, real integration and then of course there exists the property of the linearity now i have used this word so much in my first unit that i would like you to tell me what would be the property of the linearity for these contour integrals linearity you have done linear operators you have done linear vector space the word does not mean anything different in any field once the word is defined then it will be defined please understand that whenever we discussed about the linearity there were two things we were discussing one is the additivity part and another is the homogeneity part what is the additivity part sum of two function is indivisible f1 plus f2 what is the homogeneity part multiplication of some scalar multiplication by some scalar so this some guy when i am saying is linear what does it mean individual integration so k1 c fz dz plus k2 c fz dz in fact you have done that when we defined our differential operator as the linear operator and also the integral operator i as the linear operator what is it meant then when i am saying that the integral operator is linear it means exactly this that if we have two functions and the scalars k1 and k2 then this will this left hand side will be equal to the right hand side so these are some of the properties which this contour integral follow now since we are discussing about the complex plane and i have already told you something about curve so i would also like to say that we use the word this curve or contour rather interchangeably and it's a very common practice we are going to in fact see that to represent this guy in terms of the integral so between let's say a and b or z0 and zn in terms of this parameterization 
I am going to solve something and you will see. That we are going to do it whenever there is a curve or a real or a continuous function. I can always write down my where complex variable as a function of real variable T such that what I will say that I am going to do the integration from Z0 to Zn will be the integration from A to B in real part. And I will be representing my function Z as Xt plus Iyt. This is what we are going to use when we are going to do the path of integration. But this is what the curve, whenever the word curve comes, it means that the function is continuous. The functions which we are dealing with, the ones which are continuous over some path. And once it is there, then we can use this one. So if I have to define a smooth curve, what does that mean? Word is smooth. So it so does not have any discontinuity. Yeah, but the continuity was already there in the curve itself. So if I say a smooth curve, differentiability. Right. The word is the continuity does not imply differentiability. As soon as I use the word smooth, it means that this function is differentiable. So I have these points also well defined. These guys. So. I just wanted to do it so that you remember and this is these are just the definition. Please see even though we are applying it here in the complex plane, but this will remain valid even in the real one. So somebody says there is a smooth curve. It means that the function is differentiable at each of the point on the curve or at least piecewise differentiable in this. Yeah. OK, now. Simple. Closed path. I'm just defining few things because we are going to integrate over some paths, so I'm just defining few things. So simple closed path. What is this guy? Sometimes we call it also closed contour. Simple closed path. So closed path, of course, it means this. Any path which is closed is closed path. It's in the complex plane, so of course we are talking about something that is starts from the same point and end at the same point. And it is just that. So closed point. What would be the simple closed path? The word simple. Whatever you remember. Please see that. I mean, you have done your uh, complex. Yeah, please go ahead. Sir, if we can. Uh... Uh, well, uh, we can represent that closed path in a point means somehow. Oh, that we will uh, do in the domain. Right now, I'm only talking about the path. That means I am talking about something only about the line which I have drawn. Right. Remember, the path is something just a line. So closed path is nothing but uh, just only these lines which is complete. So I will discuss that uh, immediately next. A simple closed path or the contour or close contour is such the one which does not intersect or touch does not intersect or touch at any point so now tell me the first one is this a simple close path or not yes sir Yes, sir. yes, sir. Second one. Yes, is sir. this a simple closed path or not? No, sir. No, sir. No, no, sir. no. no sir. Because no, it is sir. intersecting at this point. Third one. Is it a simple closed path or not? Yes, sir. Yes, yes sir. sir. Because it is not touching itself or intersecting with each other at any point. So when we say simple closed path in complex plane, we are talking about the path which does not intersect with each other. Yeah, as soon as it will start intersecting each other, there will be some other concept, which is basically the winding. We may discuss it a little bit. OK, so what we have discussed curve. Or a contour. A smooth curve or a smooth contour. 
and then simple close path. Now something which you guys are OK, somebody re, uh, said. Simply. Connected. Domain. So now I am talking about something. Like this and I am talking about the entire area. D, which is let's say my domain. Fine, so now I'm trying to define something what is called simply connected domain and then of course. Multiply connected domain. So what will be simply connected domain? If now you can um, say that uh, um, uh, the closed. Yes. Any simple closed path. Sir, when the cl can be shrunk to a point. Can be shrunk to a point. Mm -hmm. OK, so I'll just uh, say it a little bit. Although you have uh, read the. Concept, so I am pretty sure that you know that it is just that. Let's just uh, revise it once more to ensure that we understood understand it properly. OK, and. I'm sorry. One line actually entered into that region where I did not want it to be OK. So let me just discuss. If we take any simple closed path in this domain, which is we call a simply connected domain, and we shrink it continuously. So continuously means that when we are shrinking it, then also we are looking at this. What is happening to this simple closed path? Then this guy can shrink it continuously to a point, to a single point, without going outside the domain. And this is true for every simple closed path, not for few. Every simple closed path, if you shrink it continuously, so I have taken a path, let's say which is I have uh, represented by this white line, although I should have used something, but I, OK, I mean the concept is known. Or maybe I should have said taken the red one. Anyway, so this guy, if I try to shrink it continuously so that I am observing at each point whenever I am shrinking, then this guy can shrink to a point without going outside this domain D. And this is true for every simple closed path, not for one or two. It will be true for everyone. So these kind of domains we call as the simply connected domain. Whereas the multiply connected domains will be the ones in which. If we take simple closed path, there is a possibility that if we try to shrink it, then this guy. For example, if we take this simple closed path, since every simple closed path uh, should be shrunk to zero without going outside. So what will happen in the multiply connected domain? So in this case. Uh, OK, what case is when it I have can go outside the domain. So it will go outside the domain, particularly in the hole which is there where the function was not. I mean, uh, the domain was not defined. So multiply connected domains will be the domains where if we take a simple closed path and shrink it continuously, then some of those closed paths will go to a point. But then they will be going outside the domain. So in this case, it will be going, for example, outside the domain when it will just be shrunk. So in very simple language, we call the domains with Holes. Uh, 
are the multiply connected domains, whereas the domains with no holes as the simply connected domain. And in fact, we call this kind of a domain, the one where I have drawn the red contour, this is uh, called doubly connected. And then we have, what about this? Is this the doubly connected one? Multiple. Multiple, so multiple connected. in this case is triply connected. But I am, okay, I am going to draw something and I will ask this question tomorrow then. So which one of the two? Which one of the two is the doubly connected? So triply connected I have shown. So you may be able to actually guess, but please do read it. The questions now for what we have just done about the paths and the contours. Sir, we are going to shrink the path or the domain in this case. Oh, you so cannot shrink the domain. You cannot get shrink the domain, right? No, no, shrink. When I draw drew the domain, the whole point of the mean the word uh, domain is that this is something which is already defined, right? And we say every simple closed path in it, which means I am just drawing paths, which may be simple closed, not maybe, uh, which are the simple closed path, any, any simple closed path. So domain does not change. It is the simple closed path, which when shrinks continuously to a point, that should not go outside the domain. Got the point? Yes, sir. OK, so do, that is the difference between the word domain and the path. So I want you to clearly understand that on the previous page when I wrote simple closed path, that is what I meant uh, when I was saying that I'm just talking about the outer line when I am talking about the simple closed path. It is the path which we were discussing, whereas when we are talking about the domain, then we are talking about the entire region enclosed by some boundary. Anything else? No, sir, thank you. OK, no, not only for you, but others. OK, let's do one integration today. Let C be a piecewise. Somewhere I should write it because I have been saying it every time smooth path so piecewise is smooth path so i can call it my smooth curve or even contour represented by z is equal to z t where a okay so there is a piecewise smooth path in a Z plane. OK. Let. FZ be a. Continuous. Function on. C. Then in that case, so what we are going to do in our example, which we call as integration using this path, we are going to use this parameterization. So just look into it carefully that we are going to write since Z as a function of T. So we are going to do DZ over DT or Z dot times DT. So the contour integral in that case, if C is any piecewise smooth path and FZ be a continuous function on that C, then the integral FZ DZ over that C can be written as A to be F of Z T DZ over DT. OK, so the first question which we are trying to answer, which we are going to answer is whether. Complex valued function FZ. Be. Path dependent. Or path independent, so this is the question which we are going to try. Does anybody already has the answer to this question? 
What about the real valued functions? Fx? Are they path dependent or path independent? Then you did say that. I'm sorry. Uh, path? I think dependent, path dependent. Real valued function? Yes, usually they are path, path dependent. Uh, usually they are path dependent. Right? I mean, what you are trying to say is that if I want to go from one point to this point, if I go from this way or that way or some other way, then the area under the curve will change, which means that the integral of the function be. OK, let. Integral of the function. What about the co and complex function? Are they part dependent or they path independent? Sir, I think independent. So we are going to answer this question. Fine. So let's just see. We can or we cannot, but let uh, we'll take an example. Do this using our integration using path and see if it is or if, if it is not. So we are going to do two questions. Question number part one A. We are going to use F Z is equal to Z. And then B. We are going to use F Z is equal to real part of Z. So here the uh, function is this X plus I Y. Here you can think about it is just. And we are going to integrate it using two paths. What are the paths which we are going to do? The paths which we are going to use is, are these. So X, Y. So this point. Which will be represented by 1 plus 2 I. Going from 0, OK. This is one path and I will call it C. And another is basically I am going to uh, integrate between the same point 0 and 1 plus 2 I, but not in that fashion. What we will do? So we will have first path, which is this 0 to 1, which I will call as C1. And then the second path is this. So this is this. And this I will call C2. So we will integrate both A and B using our first path, let's say 1, and our second path. And we know that the integral in this case from 0 to 1 plus 2i will be sum of C1 plus C2. In this case, of course, the integral is directly defined as a straight line between this. So let me do one in class and two you will do back at home. OK. A1. A1 was function is given as Fz is equal to Z. And what is Zt? This is something you will have to tell me that means parameterization such that if I go from this path. So if I change T between 0 to 1, then I go using this path C from point 0, 0 to 1 plus 2 I. A straight line. So problem in the integration using path boils down to just writing down your ZT. That is how will you write your ZT? A straight line, by the way. This is this should be rather simple. That if you have point anywhere in between, then you should be reaching this point. If you have any point in between, then you should be reaching this point. So what will be the parameterization of ZT? From 0, 0 to 1 plus 2i. T plus 2ti. T plus 2i times t. Excellent. This is all. Now, if you look into it, so from 0, 0, 
this point will lead you to 1 plus 2 i remember it's a function which is passing through zero so there is no intercept they, you have to think only about the slope and nothing else and hence this should not be very tough but yes our problem of integration using path depends on us writing this okay now this once this is written then the problem becomes rather simple what is dz over dt One plus two i. One plus two i. Excellent. So that means if I have to integrate over c, and I am going to write, I'm sorry, this guy is okay. F z d z, which is nothing but zero to one f of z t d z over d t times d t. Which is in this case, what is the function? Function is z. So, what should so I write plus, here? T plus two i t. I t. What is dz over dt? One plus two i dt. So now you just do this integral because this simple integral over t, which is a real variable. Of course, it will have two components. One is the real, another is the imaginary. Please do that. So zero to one, you should have what? T plus two i t. Another one two i t. So that means it will be four i t minus. Four t dt. Okay, so this four t minus four t and t will become minus three t. I do that in the graph. I'm I'm pretty sure. Give me the final result. Can't we just take t common and then integrate oh. directly? Whatever way, whatever way. I mean, you can. It is a real function, right? It is just uh, that it's a complex number i is coming. Other than that, it is whatever you do. You do t common. You do whatever way you want to. But you should get one result at the end. Minus three by two. Minus three by two. Minus three by two plus two ida. I mean, whole two. idea, whole idea that you are parameterizing in terms of t, which is a real parameter, is this that you know your real integration very nicely. So this is good. Okay. And I'm pretty sure that all of you must get it. So let's just do the second part of it, which is let's just do question A with now one through C one and next to C two in order to utilize this one. So let's just do this quickly in today's class itself. So let me just write down A two. So first C one. So see that you are going just like that in real axis. So f z of course in this case is z. What is z t? If I just take zero t less than equal to one. Imaginary t. This will be t, right? There is no term in the imaginary. And can you also do? Uh, Okay, let me just do dz over dt, which will be one. One, very good. For c two, so if we go from here up to, so this will be going from one zero to one to i. You can write it in uh, uh, several ways, but this. Let me just use one. One plus i t, where zero t less than equal to two. Or you could have done it one plus two i t with zero to t to one. It is one and the same thing. And this will be dz over dt. This will be equal to i. I. Okay. So let's just integrate c one. So we have the function t. We have the dz over dt one d t. So going from zero to one, result. 
Half. Half, mm. which is for path C1. What will be for the path C2 when I'm going from 0 to 2? Let's see the function. 1 plus i t. This is function. Then dz over dt is i and then dt. So this will be 0 to 2. I minus T DT I mean, in case if you want to write. Two I minus two. Two, two I, I minus. minus two. So what is the combined sum of C1 plus C2? So OK, let me just put right. This will be two I minus two plus half. 2i minus 3 by 2. Minus 3 by 2 plus 2i. Right. Now, please two compare this result from the result which we have got on the previous page for different path. So, what do we get? Path independence. Okay. For function fz is equal to z, whether we use path C or whether we use C1 plus C2, the integration come out to be same, which means that this function is surely path independent. Something which we do not see that often in the case of real access, because the area which is un, 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 enclosed, oh, sorry, area which is enclosed under the curve, that is different if you are thinking about a real function. Fine. Now, please do as a homework. What? As a homework, please do this B1 and B2. Remember now our function Fz is only real Z. So do that using this function for both parts, and we will take that as our starting point for tomorrow's class. So let me just try to summarize what we have done in today's class. We have tried to introduce you to you the concept of complex integration. As soon as we define it, we understand that it is done by a Riemannian integral, which is same as what we do in our real integration. However, the path of integration is especially called curve or contour here. We need to define certain paths and we define simple closed path. Then we also define domains and we will see why we have defined it because remember our analyticity is defined in the domain uh, and that's why we are basically interested in doing that. But that is what we are carrying in. We defined our curve, a smooth curve or the contours or the smooth contours, simple closed path, simply connected domains and the multiply connected domains. And we have used one particular method, which we call as the path of integration to evaluate integrals. And the big question which we are trying to answer is whether the integral of fz, dz, the path dependent or path independent all the times or in some of the times. We considered one function fz is equal to z. That result turns out to be path independent for the two paths considered. You are going to do as the homework now part B, which is Fz is equal to X or real Z and then integrate it over these two contours to see whether you are what result you are getting. Questions. So can you please explain uh, Zt in case of uh, A, A2? Uh, A2? Yes, A2. A2. A2, case. A2. Yeah, yeah, yeah. OK. Next. So. Remember, it's a real axis and the imaginary axis, the two component of Z. Yeah. So when you are going from 0 to 1, think about it only on the real axis. So that means only the real number is changing and the imaginary number is exactly at 0. Right? Yes, sir. So all that you have to think, nothing else. It's a straight line from 0 
टू वन इन द रियल एक्सिस सो टी इफ यू कीप ऑन इंक्रीजिंग रियल वेरिएबल देन यू आर गोइंग टू गेट दिस नंबर राइट yes sir so a path so let's just think what we have done a path which is represented as this in a complex plane the real parameterization is that i can write zt is equal to t over this where t will be integrated from 0 to 1 fine and yes. then the second path if you look into this now your x value is fixed to 1 so of course that will not change if once you are going on the path number 2 c2 in this it is basically going from 0 to 2i right yes sir so that means that in the your constant x number is fixed to a constant value 1 and y value i used it as i times t can you think of anything else I mean, I use the integral from zero to two, and you see that this guy will take you to two i. You can also think of something else. A straight line from one zero to one two i. All right. Yeah, but clearly that this is uh, this is how we are doing it in our complex plane. The remember. So if I is, take uh, t yeah. from zero to one, then I have to I have to write one plus two i t. Yeah, of course. I mean, ultimately, you have to reuse this path completely. What are you saying? What we are saying is, this path is parameterized by this variable t. So, your path will not come completely, right? If we have one plus i t, that means t is going from zero to two. If I have written one plus two i t, that means then t would be integrated from zero to one, right? Yes, sir. Got it, sir. Got it. Thank you. Uh, पर आप लोगों ने ये किया नहीं हुआ है इन द पास्ट आई मीन आई एम जस्ट क्यूरियस नॉट यर सर ये नहीं किया जेट नहीं किया शायद नहीं अच्छा इंटीग्रेशन यूजिंग पाथ यू गाइस डिड नॉट डू इट ओके ओके फाइन एनीथिंग एल्स ओके सो सिंस इट्स टाइम फॉर द नेक्स्ट क्लास सो स्टॉप रिकॉर्डिंग and transcription yeah. okay. i have sent you the mail on